Jerusalem Mill is one of the oldest and most intact mill villages in the state of Maryland. In a few words, it is simply a treasure to Harford County, Maryland. Hello, my name is Brad Enzer. I'm a Boy Scout from Troop 801 in Falston, Maryland. And for my Eagle Scout project, I'm going to walk you through the history of Jerusalem Mill and how the Friends of Jerusalem Mill continue to preserve this village and bring history to life. On May 29, 1687, Nicholas Hempstead and John Wadley had a tract of 318 acres of land surveyed and patented as Jerusalem. In 1700, Henry Risley purchased Jerusalem for 2,500 pounds of tobacco. For unspecified reasons, the land subsequently reverted to the proprietor until a prominent ironmaster, Stephen Onion, acquired it. In 1743, Onion had it resurveyed. At that time, it contained two 40-foot tobacco barns of little worth, and two old 20-foot dwelling houses in sorry condition, 500 panels of fencing, and 50 scrubby apple trees, all on 368 acres. In 1768, Zacchaeus Onion hired Quaker millwright Isaiah Linton to repair and improve the then-existing ironworks and mills, which were further downstream from the current village of Jerusalem. Linton, one of seven children, was born on November 15, circa 1740, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Linton, by birth, was a member of the Religious Society of Friends, known as Friends or Quakers. He was educated in the Quaker tradition. Based on the conviction that education must make one familiar with the spiritual forces surrounding their life, understanding the problems of social life, and to understand the workings of one's indulged profession. In September 1769, Isaiah Linton and Miller David Lee, a fellow Quaker, entered into a partnership to build and operate a grist mill. They purchased the Jerusalem land tract which was conveniently located on the fall line of the Little Gunpowder River. It had a strong river flow and a 25-foot fall. These features allowed Linton to design and install a mill featuring wooden internal water wheels. This design, though not unique, contrasted with the more prevalent external wheel design. The five-story merchant mill, one of Maryland's largest at 60 feet long and 36.4 feet in width, was completed in August of 1772. David Lee set his name firmly in the wall of the new mill, where it can still be seen today. Isaiah Linton began purchasing water, milling, and property rights. On August 13, 1772, Linton and Lee entered into agreement to use Lee's merchant mill as a milling, grinding, and manufacturing business. Lee agreed to pay one half of the profits to Isaiah Linton for a four-year term. The mill became dependent on shipments of barrels of flour by road and water. Shipments were sent to Great Britain and the Caribbean. Jerusalem Mill is the fourth of Linton's mills along the Little Gunpowder Falls. In 1775, Isaiah Linton was injured during the erection of Onion's Lower Merchant Mill, and on November 26, 1775, he died from complications of the accident. His accident was later described by his youngest brother, William Linton. In 1777, William wrote, Isaiah was seriously injured in a milling accident while raising a runner stone with block and fall to the first story of the mill. When the timber gave way at the hood and his left leg was crushed by the stone. There were only children assisting at the time and the elders had to be summoned from the fields to roll the stone off, which was embedded on its edge. Isaiah's left leg was removed and he lost his sight from his left eye and was later aided by a peg. According to Maryland and Pennsylvania court records, Linton was described as a good father, a learned man, miller, millwright, skilled master builder, yeoman, gentleman, planter, farmer, and Quaker elder. Even though Isaiah Linton lived only 36 years, he left a legacy of accomplishments, including 18 mills, one ironworks, and numerous dwellings and outbuildings. Today, over 200 years later, Two of the mills, including Jerusalem Merchant Mill, and many dwellings and outbuildings still remain as a testimony to his engineering abilities. In 
In the 1790s, the mill was upgraded to include mechanization recently patented by inventor Oliver Evans. This greatly reduced the amount of labor involved in the milling process by allowing the same water power that drove the grindstones to run conveyors and other processing tasks. David Lee died in 1816, leaving his estate, houses, mills, and improvements to his son, Ralph Sackett Lee. During the 45 years of Ralph's management, Jerusalem Mill reached phenomenal success and profit. Lee advanced the idea of milling white flour by shaking it through silk screens until all bran had been removed. This finest silk flour was custom ground for the Jewish Passover celebration in Baltimore. He also demonstrated to his gunpowder neighbors that grain could be raised with greater economic stability than tobacco. On July 11, 1864, Confederate Harry Gilmore led a raid across Baltimore and Hartford counties. The raid was part of an overall campaign conducted to disrupt Union transportation and communications. Major Gilmore and 135 of his men, parts of the 1st and 2nd Maryland Cavalry, passed through Jerusalem Mill, stopping at McCourtney's General Store to requisition nearly $1,000 worth of supplies and horses. From Jerusalem, they continued to Magnolia Station, where they burned a train and the railroad bridge. For over 100 years, the mill was known as Lee's Merchant Mill. Then, in the mid-1870s, it became known as the Jerusalem Merchant Mill. The name Jerusalem derives from the original 1687 Jerusalem land patent that abutted Lee's Merchant Mill. By the late 1870s, other interests of the Lee family were becoming more important than the mill, shop, and farm enterprises. In 1886, the mill and 25 acres, including the dam and mill race, were sold to Ezra E. Phillips for $6,400. The original 1772 pitchback water wheels were replaced around 1900 with two iron turbines, which still lie half buried in the wheel pit room of the Jerusalem Merchant Mill. One turbine was made by Barry and Zecker, and the second by Fitz Waterwheel Company. My name is Chris Scovel. I'm curator of the museum for the Friends of Jerusalem Mill, and we're in the basement of the Jerusalem Mill, where I'd like to describe the functioning of the original configuration. Notable by its mural depiction were the two original upright water wheels, which in turn powered the mechanisms in the mill. Um, Incidentally, the one on the right has not been detailed to the extent of the one on the left, but picture two matching uh, water wheels here. We can be smug and say, well, how crude, but remember when these were built in 1772, what were your options? You did not have the internal combustion engine. Electricity had not yet been harnessed. They had not even um, patented the steam engine. So a lot of work was going to be done by men or animals or water power, and believe me, they're very creative in using water power. This configuration generated 40 horsepower of energy, which in turn drove the components in the mill and gave them the capacity of milling about 20 barrels of flour a day, a loaded barrel weighing 196 pounds. As with any industry, as time went on, they made changes, improvements as they saw them. So you see sticking up out of the floor the remains of turbines. These were installed around 1900. Whereas the former wheels were upright, these lay on their side with veins or baffles exposed. The water would come through, strike the wheels, causing them to turn. So now your, your shafts are turning upright as versus horizontal previously. Obviously missing our components which would attach to this. To transfer this power in, uh, internally, where you drive corn showers, grain augers, whatever you had in the way of powered equipment. In both cases, the water having originated on our left would have done its work and then exited the arch on the right wall here, now filled in with stone. There's no reason for it to be open today. This would appear to be too good to be true, the fact that you're using free water power from the river to make this whole complex uh, work. But there is no free lunch. 
The issue is the dam and the race, which were necessary to transport the water down here to power these components, the dam was always at risk. Not much of a dam. It wasn't higher than this railing here and was made out of logs. And I know from witnessing floods on this river, impressive amounts of debris are carried down river, in some cases trees this diameter, 40 feet long, and they're just careening down the river. So should you have a dam there, it would always be at risk of being struck and splintered. So around 1940, apparently having suffered one of these damaging floods, the miller at the time had somebody come out, look at the damage, quote him a price to repair it. The miller thought about it for a while and chose at that point, rather than to invest more money in the earlier system, to convert to electricity. And all he did is tie into the nearest power pole and install motors. And that's the system from which the mill was operated for the last 20 years of its life. Jerusalem Mill Village continued to thrive through the first part of the 1900s. By the 1920s, the 150 years of Lee ownership ended with the remaining farmland being broken up and sold. During the Depression years, the mill kept busy, with S. Slater Greenfield operating it under Harry Pyle's ownership. I am Mildred Greenfield Emil, the miller's daughter. My father, Samuel S. Greenfield, worked at the Jerusalem Mill from 1910 to 1942. The mill's owners during that time were W.W. Wilson, A.A. A. Hurley, and later Harry S. Paul. For about a short period, my father leased the mill from Mr. Pyle and my brother Calvin Slater Greenfield worked for him. I, oh yes, I remember the mill. Dusty inside with masses of cobwebs drooping everywhere and the machinery cranking away. There was an office at the front with a big whole desk and chair and the old style crank telephone. I loved to go in and sit at that desk. The village then was beautifully kept. Each house well kept. Each yard had a tidy fence with a whitewashed gate. Mr. Paul lived nearest the mill among stately trees with smooth green lawn and shrubs blooming at the edges. Mrs. McCourtney at the store had roses climbing her fence. The whole effect was of a quaint country village. We lived about a mile away on Old Dropper Road, an almost daily routine in the hot weather was a walk to the mill race for a swim. But the mill race was important for another reason besides our swims. Persons who joined the Mountain Christian Church were baptized there. Today, sad to say, the race is just an overgrown dry ditch. In the late 1930s, a flood washed out the mill dam, forcing major alterations and repairs. By this time, the traditional millstones had been replaced by roller mills, electricity replaced water power, and a new metal roof was installed. The last miller, James D. or Jack Bridges, diversified his enterprise by selling gasoline, tobacco, beer, candy, and dog food besides the usual custom grinding for neighbors. In a pond near the bridge, he raised mallards and sold duck eggs. After the Great Depression, the village as a unit started into a slow but steady economic decline. Around 1940, the general store closed and the mill ceased operation in 1961 after the death of Jack Bridges. The state of Maryland purchased the mill, the blacksmith shop, and the gun shop 
as an early acquisition in the Gunpowder Falls State Park. Unfortunately, the building sat vacant and fell into severe disrepair. In 1985, a group of local residents formed the Friends of Jerusalem Mill and began efforts that led the state of Maryland to ultimately rebuild the mill for adaptive use as the headquarters of the Gunpowder Falls State Park and to subsequently acquire all the remaining structures in the village. These preservation efforts have resulted in Jerusalem Mill Village returning as a largely intact historical area which is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The gun shop was built around 1770. Oral tradition has it that during the Revolutionary War, David Lee, John Kidd, Nathan Bond, Giddings Wilson, James Wood, and Edward Connard manufactured black walnut stocks and assembled muskets for the Maryland militia. The question that is frequently asked is how could David Lee, a Quaker, enter into a materials of war contract? Did his patriotism override his religious fervor? Or did his keenness for business make it too difficult to turn down the opportunity? The questions remain unanswered. Lee later used the buildings to make flour barrels, tubs, and other materials required for daily operation. On the 1860 plat, the gun shop is listed as the C shop and is most likely the Cooper shop as listed in Ralph Lee's 1862 estate inventory. A Cooper is someone that makes wooden staved barrels. Over the years, the building has served as a cabinet maker shop, a cider mill, a cannery, and a residence. In the mid 1800s, David Lee II, grandson of the first miller, built a stone mansion of 20 rooms to replace the original Lee family home, which had burned. The general store, known as McCourtney's, is located on the east end of the village and built circa 1830. By 1844, a post office was housed in the general store. In 1881, the store was leased to Samuel Oliver McCourtney, who later bought it outright. The McCourtney family lived on the second floor until Mr. McCourtney's death in 1939. A remarkable man who never drove an automobile, he made a practice of walking to Baltimore each year, a 40-mile round trip which he cut to a one-way trip when he reached his 80s. A big pot-bellied stove was the centerpiece of the store. Crackers, Tootsie Rolls, licorice, Necco wafers, gumdrops, shoelaces, and some bolts of calico, gingham, and duck were placed in the glass cases. Barrels of flour, sugar, and meal were placed on the side of the store. Following the death of Mr. McCourtney, the store was converted to an apartment, a function it filled until 2006 when the Friends of Jerusalem Mill returned the space to a representation of its original purpose. The building across the street from the mill is labeled on the 1860 Jerusalem Mill plat and the 1877 map as the bee shop. By making everyday items and fixing parts, blacksmiths were essential for everyday life in the 1800s. The Friends of Jerusalem Mill have restored the structure to serve once again as a blacksmith's shop, and on Saturdays and Sundays one can visit the shop and learn how many everyday useful items were made. The spring house was built in 1840. Its purpose was to prolong the shelf life of food particularly milk products by using the 56 degree water from the ground springs to chill ceramic crocks filled with foodstuffs. A cutout in the ceiling allowed access to overhead storage. No written account can verify but it is believed that this area was also used as a refuge from the summer heat prior to the advent of air conditioning. In 1832 a bill was legislated to build a covered bridge on Jerusalem Road over the Little Gun at Lee's Mill. This Jerusalem covered bridge was replaced in 1928. In 1865 a covered bridge was erected on present-day Jericho Road, known today as Jericho Covered Bridge. This allowed the towns of Franklinville, Jerusalem, and Jericho to be connected more conveniently. More so it allowed grain and flour to be shipped to the port town of Joppa. Although Jerusalem Road was the major route of the Baltimore and Jerusalem Turnpike, the river crossing and the subsequent bridge on Jericho Road provided an alternative crossing of the Little Gunpowder Falls since the turnpike crossing was often subject to closure due to high water levels. 
The Jericho Covered Bridge remains one of six in the state of Maryland and one of three in active use today. The bridge itself is composed of sawn and hewn large timbers as a support structure for the roadway and smaller timbers supporting the roof. Vertical siding was used to complete the structure. All of the wood for the original bridge was most likely produced by Lee's Sawmill. The bridge itself was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in September of 1978 and then included with Jerusalem Mill Village in 1987. The bank barn, the largest in Harford County when built circa 1803, housed dairy cows within its two foot thick field stone walls. Burned by an arsonist in the 1960s, there are plans to reconstruct the building as a multi-purpose space. Residence number one stands between the Lee Mansion and the mill. This L-shaped house, built around 1850, appears on the 1860 plat. Early photos from approximately 1910 show a single story with an attic. Sometime later, the owners added a second floor and remodeled. The house is now owned by the state of Maryland and leased on a long-term basis. The building is not open to the public. Residence number two is just next to the mill and was built in 1890. It was a workshop until roughly 1940. Then it was remodeled to accommodate a large family previously living in the Cooper shop. It is not open to the public. At the intersection of Jericho and Jerusalem Roads and across from the general store is the tenant house. It is believed to have been the residence of one of Ralph Lee's tenant farmers. This building is not open to the public. The Weekend Living History program focuses on the life of rural people in the 18th century. From 1 to 4 p.m. on Sundays, living history interpreters clad in period attire demonstrate the trades of blacksmithing and woodworking as well as sustenance skills such as cooking, gardening, sewing. In the general store, the middle and late 1800s are interpreted through a clothing exhibit and demonstrations. One room is devoted to the Civil War, another to the last storekeeper, and a third represents the store in the 1930s. Adjacent is a unique gift shop, offering an eclectic variety of items, including t-shirts, ironware crafted in the village, holiday decorations, historical toys, books for all ages, art prints, note cards, and much more. In the gun shop, living history interpreters cook a variety of colonial recipes, including a hearty stew, roasts, whole birds, and desserts such as a bread pudding and pastries are all cooked in Dutch ovens. Good day, my name is Diane Pry, and I'm a volunteer at Jerusalem Mill and this is the Gun Factory. Today, um, what I am going to be doing today is a roasted chicken. That's ready to go in the Dutch oven. Using forge heated iron, blacksmiths present live demonstrations making useful items from the 18th century. These items are predominantly utilitarian but also decorative and include hardware, utensils, and toys. The transformation from cold iron to artifacts is eye-opening. Skilled workers of the Friends of Jerusalem Mill have created a woodworking shop behind the gun shop. Each Sunday you can find craftsmen working with time period correct tools and methods to produce the necessary furniture and accessories for the 18th century living history program. Projects completed include a shaving horse, a tavern table, and a crossbuck table designed to be readily taken apart for the ease of transport. Tools produced by the woodworkers can be found in practice use around the mill. In the year 2000, volunteers in the Living History Program created a kitchen garden behind the gun shop. The garden displays the plants grown and gardening techniques used in the late 18th century to provide food and medicine. The produce from the garden is prepared and eaten during the hearth cooking demonstration. Besides the year-round Living History Program, Jerusalem Mill hosts special events, including a summer concert series, the Colonial Craftsman Weekend, Gilmore's Raid, and more. Admission fees apply, which directly support preservation and restoration work. 
there is no better way than to wind down summer weekends at one of Jerusalem Mills' summer concerts. The summer picnic concerts take place in the meadow of the Wheelwright stage, directly next to the blacksmith shop. Bring your picnic and your own seating. Most music is old-time traditional folk music, bluegrass, or rock and roll. The Colonial Craftsman Weekend is an event that portrays the 18th century, especially pre-Revolutionary War life. This event is a recreation of an 18th century market, where people can buy and sell goods popular in this time period. Artisans and reenactors demonstrate old crafts and trades. You can enjoy music and games and buy merchandise made with traditional methods. This whole event recreates the feeling and culture of Williamsburg on a smaller scale and closer to home. Gilmore's Raid, also known as the Magnolia Station Train Raid, was led by Major Harry W. Gilmore in July 1864. Major Gilmore and 135 of his men, parts of the 1st and 2nd Maryland Cavalry, passed through Jerusalem Mill, stopping at McCourtney's General Store, long enough to requisition supplies and horses from the store and the surrounding area. Proceeding to the Gunpowder River Bridge, Gilmore's troops captured two trains and evacuated the passengers. One of the trains was set fire atop the trestle with the intention to drop the span. The telegraph communication lines were cut, and Gilmore's troops captured Major General William B. Franklin, a passenger on one of the trains. Stopping by Addy's Hotel near Towson on his way across Baltimore County, Gilmore's men were confronted by a patrol of cavalry from Baltimore. Outnumbered over two to one, Gilmore attacked and defeated the Union cavalry patrol and pursued them so far as Govinstown where Gilmore claims they quit due to his men's exhaustion, or they would have captured Baltimore. The only fatality suffered by Gilmore's raiders occurred en route to Jerusalem when two scouts encountered Ishmael Day on Sunshine Avenue. Day, a staunch Union supporter, had hoisted a Union flag in defiance of Harry Gilmore's raiding. When First Sergeant Fields attempted to tear the flag down, an incensed Day shot Fields with a shotgun. Mortally wounded, Sergeant Fields died the next day at a hotel in Fork. The other scout raced back to the main party to report, which gave Day time to flee into nearby woods. The main party descended on Day's property and after a fruitless search they burned his home and barn in retribution. The house was subsequently rebuilt but later burned again, so all that remain of this encounter is an historic marker. Ishmael Day is buried in the cemetery of Fork United Methodist Church in Fork. Jerusalem Mill features the Gilmore's Raid reenactment on McCourtney's General Store and encounter at Ishmael Days each June. On display in the General Store are historical accounts, newspapers from the time, and a replica of Gilmore's uniform. Vintage baseball is similar to the game of baseball we are familiar with today. The ball is made of India rubber and yarn covered in leather, and the bat is made of wood. There are four bases, each with 90 feet of space between them. Pitchers throw the ball underhand to the striker, known today as the batter. Foul balls don't count as strikes. Outs are made as normal, but a ball caught on one bounce is the same as a ball caught on the fly. Gloves are not used. Jerusalem Mill is the home field for the Chesapeake Nine of Baltimore, which plays by the rules adopted in 1863. Group Tours the Jerusalem Mill Village welcomes group tours, scout troops, and school groups. Here, an elementary school teacher is interviewed about how her students come to Jerusalem Mill on a field trip every year. Hi, welcome to Jerusalem Mill. Hi, my name is Terry Kittle, and I'm a teacher at Oak Grove Classical Christian School, and we come here to supplement our American history curriculum. What do you think your students gain out of coming here every single year? Well, you know, living in the modern world, they really sometimes don't understand how things were made 200, 250 years ago. So it's wonderful for them to understand how soap is made. And we just came from the blacksmith shop, and they, they got to see how the, the, um, the iron was formed into hooks and for horseshoes. And it's like a hands-on way of learning. So would you come back again? Oh yes, we've been coming for multiple years, and uh, it's usually not rainy, so it's usually even more beautiful, but um, yes, we definitely come back every fall. What would be the biggest highlight of your day? Well, one of the people that we really enjoy meeting is Ben Franklin. 
and um, he speaks to the children for about 20 or 25 minutes. He answers their questions, and he is in full colonial attire, and uh, it's just a great way for them to meet one of the founding fathers. Thank you, Mrs. Kittle, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. As well as visiting the historic venues, one can picnic in the meadow, fish for trout in the river, and hike, bike, or horseback along miles of trails emanating from the village. Hi, my name's Harry Sanders. I have the great privilege of living next to this wonderful little village called Jerusalem. Uh, the story starts with me uh, with my son coming home on a summer day with his uh, friend Alan Tochterman and inquiring why the old village is falling down and things are in disrepair. And at that time, the uh, state of Maryland owned a lot of the buildings here in the village and simply did not have the money to uh, repair or maintain them. As a consequence of that conversation, uh, I met with uh, some of the community leaders, the principal of the elementary school, and some other friends. And we formed the Friends of Jerusalem Mill. The Friends of Jerusalem Mill is an all-volunteer organization that uh, over the years has helped restore a lot of the buildings. We've worked with the state of Maryland, the Department of Natural Resources. And as of today, the entire village is on the National Register of Historic Places. You can be part of this effort by becoming a member of the Friends of Jerusalem Mill or volunteering your time. Your talents are welcome. Do you see yourself as a living history interpreter, a tour guide, or gift shop associate? Or if you prefer behind the scenes, your administrative and maintenance skills are needed for the everyday functioning of the village. For information, please refer to the Jerusalem Mill webpage or contact Jerusalem Mill directly. When I lived in Falston, my husband and I would come to Jerusalem Mill to hike the Little Gunpowder Trails. We would go in both directions, but I especially enjoyed the trail to the Jericho Covered Bridge. I remember as a child, my parents loading us, the children in the family car on Sunday afternoons for a drive in the country. We always ended up at the Jericho Covered Bridge. To this day, I always search out covered bridges while on vacation. Jerusalem Mill offers so much for the entire family. Come and make your own memories. I'm delighted to be at Jerusalem Mill. This is the first time I've ever been here. I'm finding it precious and delightful and charming. Hi, my name is Art Benzer, and on behalf of the Friends of Jerusalem Mill, we'd like to thank you for your visit today. We hope this is a good one. A special thanks also have to go out to Brad Ensor of Boy Scout Troop 801 in Foster, Maryland for making this documentary possible. Like other historical sites such as Williamsburg and Mount Vernon, our mission is to inspire, educate, and instill an appreciation for our American heritage to all who visit. Between artifacts, displays, and talks, you will get a brief history and overview of the village. We hope to see you for our Civil War event, our summer concert series, and our colonial encampment in the fall. And thanks for coming. Goodbye.